we're continuing our look at the book of Philemon, and we're getting really close to the end, and uh, today we're just going to be looking at two verses from this letter to Philemon, verses 21 and 22, and uh, we're going to be talking about the fact that accountability is an indispensable aspect of spiritual growth. So if spiritual growth is something that is, is something that you value, if it's something that is important to you and something that you definitely want to see in your life and in the lives of those around you, accountability really needs to be an aspect of that. It's an important aspect. And in this portion of scripture, we see a, a, just a, a very powerful illustration of how accountability can operate, even among friends, even among uh, believers. And so if you would turn with me to the book of Philemon, again, we're in verses 21 and 22 today. And this is what it says. Confident of your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I'm hoping that through your prayers, I will be graciously given to you. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for the privilege to be able to look at these two brief verses and some of the companion scriptures that go with them today. We're grateful, Lord, that on this morning that we're able to just gather together and to worship you. We know, Lord, that there are all sorts of things that we could be doing during this time, but you've given us the privilege to be able to set aside time to worship you, to gather together as a body, to be able to look at your word and by your grace to grow from it. And Lord, we pray that as we look at this portion of Scripture together, as we think about this idea of accountability, as we see this illustration, how this, how this really played out in the lives of Paul and Philemon and others, we pray, Lord, that you'd teach us a little bit more about something that you're encouraging us to participate in as well. So Lord, thank you again for the privilege to be able to look at these things together today, and we commit this time to your care, and we pray that you'd speak to us now by your Spirit. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so when you're reading through the pages of history, one of the things you'll notice is a pattern that is prevalent among some of the world's leaders. And I say some because it's not, it's not universally present with uh, all leaders, but it's definitely a pattern that's prevalent among some. And one of the things that you'll notice is that eventually when they've amassed a, a, enough power they will do everything they can to avoid remaining accountable to other leaders and to the people that they're, they're, they're called to lead. And uh, that's true among people who lead in really any capacity, whether they be kings, whether they be church leaders, whether they be leaders in other areas of life, lack of accountability eventually leads to an abuse of power. Lack of accountability eventually leads to an abuse of power. And it's not just leaders who need accountability in their life. We all need accountability, every single one of us. Years ago, I had the chance to hear Chuck Swindoll speak. I don't know if you're familiar with Chuck Swindoll. Anyone familiar with him? Yeah, uh, many of us. Okay, good. Well, Chuck Swindoll, excellent speaker. He's been serving in pastoral ministry for many decades. I would assume at least 50 years he's been serving in pastoral ministry possibly more, but he also, during the course of his ministry, served for a season as a seminary president. He was president of uh, Dallas Theological Seminary for a while. And when I heard him speak, so this, is, uh, this would have been, I think, in 1997, I think it was December of 1997, uh, while he was speaking, he pulled a small card out of his shirt pocket. And the card had a series of pointed questions that he was prepared to answer at any given moment. And I don't remember the specific questions that he had on his list of questions, but I do remember the fact that when he brought that card out, he was in the midst of telling us a story about a group of guys that he regularly met with. It was a small group of men who would ask him the questions that were on that small card. And then he would likewise ask them those same questions. And so they had a relationship where they would go back and forth asking each other these pointed questions to help promote accountability in their leadership and in their spiritual lives. And I bring that up because it's kind of useful for us as individual believers to be able to ask the question, who do we allow ourselves to be accountable to? Who are we allowing ourselves to be accountable to? In my life, there are three active rungs of accountability that I could list. There's actually a few others as well, but there's three primary areas of accountability or rungs of accountability that I regularly submit myself to. I'm, I'm accountable to my family, 
I'm accountable to our church family, and I'm also accountable to a group of friends that I meet regularly with for the purpose of fellowship and accountability. We get together and we ask each other pointed questions, and we do that on purpose, and we've done that for a while. But there's a risk that comes when you make yourself accountable to other people, especially when you make yourself accountable to people who love you. Because what they're going to do if they love you is they're going to eventually ask you questions that you don't want to answer. And they may encourage you to step up in areas where maybe you've just been coasting. Or they're going to encourage you to step up in areas that you've been minimizing, um, you know, the things that are expected of you. And if you're accountable to the right people, they won't just beat you down with criticism. The way they'll do it is they'll speak the truth in love, and then they'll walk with you to help you get where you need to go. So they won't just beat you down and abandon you. They'll speak the truth in love, but then they'll say, all right, I'm right here with you to walk with you in the midst of this area of growth in your life. And I bring those examples up because that's the type of thing, that's the form of accountability that I see on display in the brief portion of scripture that we just read from Philemon verses 21 and 22. Because in these verses, you have the Apostle Paul reminding Philemon that Philemon was going to be held accountable for the manner in which he lived out his faith. Paul also reminds him that, that even though Philemon was used to being the type of guy who was an overseer in charge of other people, he was going to have to give an account of his life to those who were overseeing him. And there's a few principles that I think are illustrated in just those two brief verses related to accountability that I want to highlight for us this morning, and I hope it'll be immensely helpful to each of us as we think about how, how accountability could be activated in our day-to-day -day life and how it can be a useful tool if we're aiming to grow spiritually. If, and I'll just say this, even before we dig into each of these principles, if spiritual growth is high on your list of priorities, this is one of the things that will help you get there. And one of the things that, that you can see in this portion of Scripture, first of all, is that accountability encourages obedience to the truth. Let me reread verse 21. It says this. Paul says, confident of your obedience, I write to you, and then I love how he says this here. He says, knowing that you will do even more than I say. So as Paul was writing this letter to Philemon, the words he chose and the ways he was phrasing them, you notice as we've been working our way through this letter, they start to elevate in force. He starts off with some very kind words, and he gets to the matter at hand, and then some of the things that he starts challenging Philemon to do, it starts elevating in force as he gets to the very end of the letter here. And at this point, he's prepared to basically finish this admonition. He's prepared to, to finish this challenge that he's given to Philemon, and he wanted to make sure that Philemon understood that the right thing for him to do was to follow the instruction that he had received from the Apostle Paul. And so Paul was the one, when you think back to Philemon's background, it was Paul that led Philemon to faith in Jesus Christ. It was Paul who was the one who was primarily modeling how Christian faith looked when it was lived out, and Philemon would be able to see that. It was Paul who was also directly involved in Philemon's discipleship. And so Paul had the spiritual and the relational authority to express the kind of expectations that he was expressing in this portion of Scripture to Philemon. And if you remember the context of what was going on, what had happened was Philemon had a slave. Slave ownership was very common in the Roman Empire at the time. And Philemon had a slave named Onesimus who years earlier had escaped and fled the city of Colossae where Philemon lived and fled to Rome and probably took some money and some objects and things like that from Philemon's household so that he could fund that trip. And that was something that Onesimus could have been executed for doing under Roman law. But while he was in Rome, Onesimus met the apostle Paul, and Paul led Onesimus to faith in Jesus Christ. And so now Onesimus felt led and encouraged by the apostle Paul, but also his own conviction as the Holy Spirit was convicting him to do so, to return back to Colossae, and face Philemon, and to uh, make this all right. And the Apostle Paul had said, listen, when he returns, the deal goes like this. Don't treat him like a slave. It's not even the right thing anyway. You know, it's not a practice you should be adopting from the Roman culture anyway. So don't treat him like a slave. Treat him like what? A brother. 
to treat him like a brother. Paul fully expected Philemon to treat Onesimus like a brother and not like a slave when he returned to Colossae. And Paul, in the midst of that, was expecting that Philemon would lavishly and uh, just very generously demonstrate grace and mercy to Onesimus. Paul expected Philemon to, to refresh his heart by showing that he was willing to demonstrate the heart of Christ's gospel to other people, whether he felt like they deserved it or not. And in fact, Paul here makes it clear that he was confident that Philemon would do this. And he said, I'm confident you're going you're gonna to do even more than I've instructed you to do. Confident you're, gonna, you're just going to exceed expectations. I'm confident you're going to do that. I'm confident that you're going to go the extra mile. You can see the way Paul's talking to Philemon here, right? You know, he's, he's trying to build him up. He's trying to encourage him. And I believe that Paul believed that Philemon would do this, but I also think he phrased his words or his admonition here in a very specific way because it's actually kind of like a father speaks to a child. It's kind of the way that you would see a father speaking to a child that he loves. And uh, I don't think Philemon would have felt too good about disappointing his spiritual father. Paul was his spiritual father. Paul was the one that led him to Jesus Christ. And for this reason, I think Paul understood this, and I think we could rightfully expect that, that Philemon would have very likely gone above and beyond to honor the requests for grace and mercy that Paul was encouraging him to show on behalf of Onesimus. But have you ever noticed in your own life, so just think about this for a second, have you ever noticed in your own life how it's easier to obey those that you love than it is to obey those that you struggle to admire? Have you ever noticed that in your own life? Uh, one of the greatest examples that I ever saw of this was my grandmother. My grandmother was a very little lady, and as she grew older, her fingers became, she really struggled with arthritis in her fingers. Her fingers became very arthritic, and they kind of bent in funny ways. And the Lord blessed my, my grandparents with three sons. They had three sons th that became three grown men that were twice my grandmother's size. And I will never forget, even as a child, watching my grandmother speak to my dad and my dad's two brothers, pointing with her curly, arthritic finger, whatever she felt like saying. And it was always reasonable. She's one of the pinnacles of wisdom in my life, one of the wisest people I ever met. But when she would speak, again, half the size of these grown men, and point that finger, I would watch grown men turn into little boys and they would obey whatever she said. And I loved it because sometimes I got to watch my dad get in trouble. And that was a wonderful thing to see. And sometimes I was happy to help facilitate the trouble that he was in because I wanted to see him get in trouble. I'll never forget. I didn't plan on saying this, but it just came to my mind. I'll never forget when we went to visit them. They, they lived part of the year down in Plant City, Florida. I remember at one point, this is actually when I was in college, my dad and I were messing around in the living room when everybody was trying to sleep. And then it turned out into us like wrestling and me trying to pin my dad. And, uh, and I, I still remember my grandmother coming out of her bedroom and looking at the two of us. Mind you, at this point of life, she's used to a quiet house and not used to having to come out at like midnight to tell two people to stop wrestling, right? She comes out and she waves that finger and she says, gentlemen, I think we're gonna stop that now, aren't we? <laughs> yes, Grammy, I will stop. But dad started it, right? But I've noticed in my life that I find that I'm pretty keen to take instruction from those that I love, those that I admire. And, um, and I want to, I kind of bring that up because I, I, I think love and obedience, Scripture teaches us that they really go hand in hand. And so I just want you to think about that in a personal way for just a moment. Who do we love enough to obey? Who do we love enough to obey? Because here you have the Apostle Paul basically demonstrating that accountability encourages obedience to the truth. And I think that we're more prone to obey those that we love. And so I just want to throw the question out. Who do we love enough to obey? Or maybe I could even phrase it this way if I, I want to kind of poke at things a little bit. Many believers profess to love Jesus Christ. But do we love him enough to remain accountable to him? Or maybe I could say it this way, do we love him enough to obey him? And I would contend 
that if you don't love him enough to obey him, you may not love him at all. And the reason I say that is when you look at what Scripture tells us about love and obedience, it phrases it like this. Jesus said it this way in John 14. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. He's basically saying this is where it will become very obvious if you love me. If you love me, you're going to live out the instruction I've given you. If you love me, you'll, you'll simply do what I've told you to do. The Apostle John in 1 John chapter 5, verse 3 says it this way as well. It's a complimentary Scripture, but it says... He says, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. I think a lot of times people look at the commandments of God and they think, oh my goodness, that would just be so burdensome. You know, I don't want to have to, I don't want, don't want to, have to do that. And Jesus says, listen, if, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And John says, listen, this is what love of God looks like. If you claim to love God, you'll keep his commandments. You'll obey his teaching. Jesus was not, he didn't come to this earth to burden us. Just to clarify that, he didn't come to this earth seeking to burden us. He actually came to this earth seeking to relieve us of the burden we were trying to carry without his help. He knows that there is freedom in the obedience to the truth of his word. As we trust in him, as we remain accountable to him and accountable to his people, as we obey his teaching, what we'll actually do is we'll live in freedom. And it's freedom from the chains and the false promises of this world. This world promises us a form of freedom that isn't freedom at all. This world promises us a form of freedom that actually results in a form of mental slavery. And Christ said, listen, I didn't come to this earth because you were already free. I came to this earth to set you free. And he encourages us to walk in that freedom. It's freedom not to go back to the chains of the slavery of sin that we once lived under. It chained our thinking, it chained our lives, it chained our perspective, it chained our hope. And Christ said, no, I came to set you free from those things. And then he empowers us to walk in fellowship with him, to walk in obedience to him because we simply trust him and we love him. And if we love him, we trust you know, So I'll give you, I'll, I'll even give you, this is bonus, all right? I'm going to give you marriage advice today that you did not seek, all right? But it really follows with, if you love someone, you're more likely to obey what they have to say. Recently, as the weather turned nice, my lovely wife looked at me and she said, I would like a swing for the back deck. And I said, oh, that's nice. And, uh, and uh, she sent me a link for one online. And she, she said, here's one I like. And uh, it was like $350, something like that. I was like, oh, well, hey, those aren't free. And... Uh, and then she looked at me and she's like, I'd really like to have that swing for the back deck. And I realized I could demonstrate my love for her and obey her, or I could die right now. <laughs> and she's been enjoying a brand new swing for the past two weeks. And it's, it's lovely. But you tend to obey, you tend to listen to the one you love. And in all seriousness, I think it would be, like it wouldn't even make sense for me as, as a follower of Christ, to even call myself a follower of Christ if I'm, not, if I'm not gonna follow what he said. And scripture makes it very clear that his, he didn't come here to burden us with a whole new list to replace the old list. That wasn't the idea. He's like, let me show you what it looks like to walk in freedom because this world is lying to you. And he says, I'm telling you the truth. So don't buy into the lie, walk in the truth. And if you love me, basically he's saying, just believe what I'm saying, and you'll see, live it out. He doesn't steer us wrong. Something else, getting back to this, uh, the principles of accountability that are demonstrated here, there's another principle here that I really like. And it demonstrates that accountability actually happens in close proximity. Look at what it says in verse 22. I'm going to read this verse a couple times before we finish, but let me reread it here one more time. And uh, in verse 22 just demonstrating the, this idea that accountability happens in close proximity, you have Paul saying it this way. He says to Philemon, he says, at the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I am hoping that through your prayers, I will be graciously given to you. That's an interesting thing to say, isn't it? Now, I picked on my wife. I'm going to pick on my daughter, Julia, for a quick second here as well. Be I'm just going to work through the whole family this morning. I hope that's all right. We'll see. We'll see if they still talk to me at lunch. 
Um, but my daughter, Julia, has a unique personality. We actually get along very well. And to be honest, I find her highly entertaining. But one of the aspects of her personality that I find most entertaining is her insistence on invading my personal space. She does it all the time. She's done it her whole life. She's done it ever since she was an infant, then into toddlerhood, then into teenage years. And now as she's getting close to the end of, of high school, she still does it. She doesn't seem to be slowing down. You know, you'd think that she'd get it out of her system. It's not out of her system. So if I sit down on the couch, what happens? She wants to be seated right next to me. If I'm standing in the kitchen, this happened this past week, if I'm standing in the kitchen trying to eat something, she wants me to set it down or at least pause eating it so she can have a hug. And I'm like, why are you doing this to me? And she's like, does this make you uncomfortable? <laughs> and please don't tell her, but I actually enjoy the fact that she does this, right? But if you knew my entire family, you would know and you would see that there are definitely examples of people in our extended family that actually make it their habit to not live in close proximity to anybody else. In fact, I even have a distant relative. I haven't seen him in years because He's been avoiding intentionally interacting with the rest of our family for quite a long time at this point now, and it's partly because he doesn't want to be held accountable for the ways in which his actions have impacted the lives of others. And so we have seen this play out in his life, and he's basically lived estranged from the rest of his family. But real accountability happens in close proximity. You can't remain accountable to somebody else while purposely keeping your distance from them. And so for that reason, the Apostle Paul, when you look at the book of Acts and the things that he would do, and you look at the things that he writes in his letters as he's writing to different individuals and to different churches, he would make a point to visit churches while he was on the midst of his missionary journeys throughout the known world. He would visit churches. He would visit individuals. He basically wanted to see how they were doing and what they were excelling at and where their faith needed to be stepped up. So he would challenge them in each of these areas. And with that in mind, I enjoy reading what the, the Apostle Paul here says to Philemon as he prepared to close this letter. He told him, prepare a guest room for me. That's an interesting statement to make, isn't it? Prepare a guest room for me. This is Paul saying, you know, it's his way of saying that he fully expected to visit in person and to check in on whether or not Philemon did what he was instructed to do. Prepare a guest room for me. Now, we could read that quickly, and we could just read over that and not think a whole lot about it, but what's Paul trying to do here? He's basically telling Philemon, when you least expect it, because we don't have the internet, Philemon, and I can't just call you, there's just going to be a day when I'm going to show up and I'm going to check in and see if you did all the things I instructed you to do. So, you know, prepare a guest room for me because, you know, I think I'll, I think I'll be stopping by. That's kind of, and, and you just kind of wonder, like, when is he coming? It's like, you'll never know. <laughs> just someday he's coming. And I, I get a big kick out of the fact that the Apostle Paul says that because you could see he's purposely pushing Philemon's buttons. Or maybe you could even say it this way. He's purposely stating things in a way that really just encourages Philemon to level up. Say, just level up. Because accountability happens in close proximity, and he's saying, I'm about to come. And by the way, when do most of us, you know, you're saying prepare a guest room for me. When do most of us take extra effort to make our homes tidy? When do you try and make your home tidy? Aren't our homes most clean when we know that company is about to visit? We have a whole bunch of company coming this week, and my wife and I spent some extra time this weekend focusing on the guest room. We want to make sure the guest room looks nice. We're like, oh, we need, it needs a new towel rack. We need to get this. Let's get new curtains for it and stuff, because it's going to be in use most of the week. You know, you do a little extra. You pick up the shoes that have been piling up by the entryway. You throw out the clutter that you've been neglecting, any mail you haven't gone through yet. You go through the mail so you could toss it out, right? You look around the yard. Is there anything laying out here that I need to put away? And in a deeper sense, that's what Paul's looming promise of a visit would end up doing for Philemon. He would get his house in order because, again, Paul could be arriving at any time without announcement and then asking him, hey, what did you do while I was away? Did you follow up on doing what I had encouraged you to do when I sent that letter to you? But have you ever thought about the nature of accountability in the local church? 
and the benefit that we experience through gathering together regularly and sharing life with one another. When we commit ourselves to being present for worship on Sundays, and we commit ourselves to participating in things like, like home Bible studies and fellowship times or serving in different ministries together, we're also participating in healthy forms of accountability because we're living our lives in close proximity to one another. We're making ourselves observable to other people. We're making it so that people can actually speak into our lives. And in fact, that's why it's so tragic to see what happens when believers stop prioritizing in-person fellowship. Because when we reject it, and when we model that for our children, we're inevitably, in let, we're inevitably letting sin creep into our lives unchecked by the people that the Lord has placed in our lives, people that are meant to surround us in order to prevent that from happening. And that's why I say accountability is an indispensable facet of spiritual growth. Because there are things that sometimes we don't notice that somebody else might. And if you're living your life in close proximity with other people, you're giving them the opportunity to hopefully lovingly hold you accountable, maybe in areas that you're not observing or, or prioritizing. I read part of a study this week. It was a study that was done a little, a little while ago. It was actually done in 1990. And it was done by a group, an organization I'd never heard of, but they were called the Roper Organization for High Adventure Ministries. I know nothing about them, but I was reading a little bit of the study. I found it online, and it was a study that examined the, the personal habits and the spiritual discipline of new believers. And they actually noticed in this study back in 1990 that a high percentage of new believers they seem to drift right back to some of the same patterns of ungodliness as the rest of the world unless something happened. And in the study they said, unless discipleship and accountability became a committed part of their spiritual walk, they tended to drift right back to some of the patterns that they had said that they were finished with. I thought that was interesting, but I also think it's kind of obvious because isn't that how the Lord's encouraged the church? Isn't that how the Lord's encouraged believers to operate? Committed to discipleship, committed to accountability. So let me just throw something out there for us that I think is a bit practical. I mentioned to you that there are several rungs of accountability in my life. Uh, people, including our church family, that I hold myself accountable to, but people that have operated as my friends for quite a long time that ask me deeply personal questions. And I want to throw a few questions out there that if you have some people in your life that you would trust enough to ask you questions like this that you might find beneficial. Let me give you a few. Question one, how often are you spending time in God's word? Question two, how's your thought life right now? Question three, how are you using the abilities and the gifts and the resources that the Lord has blessed you with? Question four, are you investing in the spiritual growth of your family? Number five, are you remaining faithful to your spouse? Number six, are you feeding or are you starving your addictions? And number seven, do you regularly spend time in prayer? I think those are good questions to ask when we're trying to make ourselves accountable to other people. But they're also sometimes hard questions to answer because sometimes they expose things that might be areas of growth that we really need to wrestle with. And speaking of prayer, one of the other principles that I think Paul demonstrates when we get back to these verses in Philemon is that accountability encourages prayerfulness. Let me read again verse 22. He says, at the same time, prepare a guest room for me. And then he says, for I'm hoping that through your prayers, I will be graciously given to you. When you read about the early church, one of the hallmarks you can see in the early church was that they were a group of people that was, they were absolutely devoted to prayers. They gathered together. They would make prayer a priority. As their faith was tested, they knew that prayer was a necessity. And one of the regular topics that the early church would pray about, they would, they would frequently pray about or pray for believers who were experiencing persecution because that was a very common thing during that era of history. And Paul was one of those persecuted believers that they were praying for. So as Paul wrote this letter, 
Please keep in mind where he was when he was writing this. He was under house arrest in Rome, and he was awaiting trial because he was boldly proclaiming his faith in Jesus Christ, and he was going to be held accountable to the Roman government because of his willingness to keep preaching about Jesus, to keep teaching people what it means to follow Jesus. So he's under house arrest at the time this is taking place, and the church is praying for him and, and uh, praying for others that are dealing with various forms of persecution. And while awaiting trial, you have the Apostle Paul thinking about a lot of things. And, and uh, during that house imprisonment that lasted about two years, he would frequently think about when the day would come when he would be able to just freely walk again, just freely go about and live his day-to-day -day life, walking the streets. And so he encouraged the church to specifically be praying for him about this. He encouraged the church to pray for his release. And in this letter to Philemon, he states, I'm hoping that through your prayers, I will be graciously given to you. What he's saying is, pray, keep praying for me while I'm under house arrest. Pray that I'll be released. That's what that means. You know, I'm hoping that through your prayers, I will be graciously given to you. Now, I believe that accountability encourages prayerfulness. I think when we interact, when we spend time with each other, when we share what's going on in one, or, one another's lives with each other, when we learn about each other's joys and each other's struggles, I think we end up inevitably being reminded to pray for one another. I also think that as our love for one another grows, as we get to know each other more and more, we're compelled to pray for one another. And uh, I know I'm not alone in this, but I have a list of people and I have a list of circumstances that gets updated regularly that I pray for. I work my way through that list. I pray for these things with regularity. I pray for these people and circumstances with regularity. You may do that as well. And I often find myself rejoicing over the prayers that the Lord answers on behalf of those that I love because it's a joyful experience to see his hand at work. But accountability encourages prayerfulness. When you're spending time with other believers, when you're, when you're sharing life with one another, when you're in close proximity with one another, it encourages you to pray for one another because inevitably you find out what one another, what each other needs. I love what we're told in James chapter 5. Let me read this. This is in verse 16. In James 5, 16, it says this, Therefore, confess your sins to one another. And so we're not going to be doing that if we're not spending time with one another, right? And if we don't trust one another. But James says, therefore, confess your sins to one another. And let me say one other thing about that statement in and of itself. You know what happens when you confess your sins to, to another person? You rob sin of its power. And it, it has power when it can be operating in the shadows and operating in secrecy. And it doesn't have power when it's exposed to the light, or it doesn't, certainly doesn't have the same power. When you expose sin to the light, what you end up doing is showing it for what it really is. And so James encourages us, confess your sins to one another. And he says, and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. The prayer of a righteous man availeth much, right? The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. So we're encouraged to confess our sins to one another. We're encouraged to pray for one another. We're encouraged to build each other up in this kind of way because it inevitably helps us grow spiritually. Accountability is an indispensable aspect of our spiritual growth. So let me say this as we finish up. If you and I desire to grow in our walk with Christ and we likewise desire to see our spiritual brothers and sisters grow, we need to remain accountable to one another. And a pattern for that is demonstrated here. And when we value biblical accountability like it's modeled in Paul's letter here to Philemon, I believe we'll see greater obedience to the teaching of Christ. And I believe we'll see deeper fellowship among believers. And I also believe we'll see more fervent prayer being regularly lifted up to the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word and for the privilege that it is to be able to look at a portion of scripture like this together today and to, to think about the things that you reveal to us in it. Because Lord, when we look at a portion of scripture like this, we're seeing a very personal letter. We're seeing something that, that Philemon was receiving from the apostle Paul that was addressing something very, very specific. Lord, this was a, a real test of his faith. It was a real test of his maturity. 
it was the type of thing that, that I think confronted Philemon in ways that he needed to be confronted, but it also gave him an opportunity to demonstrate grace and mercy just as he's received grace and mercy through your son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, we know that tests will come our way as well. We know that there will be seasons of our life where people and circumstances and all sorts of things may test us in ways that, that really stretch us. And Lord, at times it's, I think it can be challenging for us to, to view those moments positively in the moment. But Lord, when we look at how your hand is at work, when we see the things that, that you have done and the things that you have demonstrated and the ways in which you use those circumstances to help our faith to grow, we can rejoice. And Lord, when we look at a portion of scripture like this, we see some real value in this idea of accountability. And Lord, we live in an era where it's very, very easy for us to avoid human interaction. We don't even have to go to a restaurant anymore to get restaurant food. It just comes to us. We don't have to go to a library to get information. It just comes to us. Everything just seems to come to us, or most things do. And Lord, even when we think about the nature of the Apostle Paul visiting the churches during that era, he couldn't just pull them up on a smartphone and FaceTime them. If he wanted face-to-face -face interaction with them, he literally needed to be face-to-face -face with them. And Lord, it was a different era. It's just... And just as it was 20 or 30 years ago here in our context. But Lord, we pray that we would not shy away from accountability. We pray that when we think about this concept of accountability, like it's illustrated in a portion of scripture like this, that we would say, you know what, that's a good thing. That's something that I absolutely need. And we pray, Lord, that you'd, you'd surround us with people in our church family, in our biological family, in our friend circles, that are people that we can love and people we could learn to trust, so that we could share the type of deeper level conversations that we need to have and so that we'll also be open to the type of things that they might lovingly point out to us along the way. And Lord, if we ever take the liberty to point something out to somebody else, we pray that we wouldn't just drop that like a word of criticism and run. We pray, Lord, that you'd help us to realize that if I'm going to bring something up in somebody's life, that I need to also walk with them in the midst of, of helping them to level up in whatever area that may be. Lord, help us to consider accountability something that's very much part of our ongoing relationship with our brothers and sisters in Christ, not just a, a word that we drop here and there. So again, Lord, we thank you for examples that you give to us frequently when we look at the lives of those who lived before us. Thank you for the ways in which you use the Apostle Paul to keep Philemon accountable and how inevitably Philemon's faith grew because of this kind of relationship. And we pray, Lord, that we would have those kinds of relationships in our lives as well because we know that they're valuable, and we know that these are things that you ultimately use to point us toward you. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for all of these things. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.